Good evening, everyone. You're very welcome to this evening's webinar, Deleterious Material in Concrete Masonry Units, Sharing the Knowledge. My name is Mike Griffin, and I'm the chairperson of the Thoman Region of Engineers Ireland. This event is being hosted by the Thoman Region and supported by the Northwest and North Regions, as long, along with the Structures and Construction Division. We have three speakers for you this evening, our own John Garrett from the Thoman Region, along with John Paul Farron and Dr. Chris Brough. Each speaker will present their slides and that will run for about 65 minutes and then we will have a Q&A session at the end. Just a reminder that you can type your questions into the Zoom question box during the event and please be sure to indicate which speaker you are directing your question to. We'll endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. So without further delay, I'd like to hand you over to our first speaker, John Garrett, to begin this evening's webinar, Deleterious Material in Concrete Masonry Units, Sharing the Knowledge. John. Thanks very much, Mike. And uh, thank you very much to the Thomond Region of Engineers Ireland for giving me this opportunity to present this uh, presentation on a matter that is extremely important for thousands of families uh, throughout the country. Uh, First of all, on my cover slide there, you will see a photograph of a house in Clare. Uh, and you'll notice that the top of the chimney is missing. Uh, I took the top of the chimney down before I let Corin go ahead because of my concern that the, the chimney could collapse. Uh, you can notice the very severe cracking on the house. Um, why are we here? We're here because of the pattern of cracking uh, that is noted on many houses suffering from this problem of deleterious material in block work. On the right hand side, I have shown a sketch taken directly from IS465, indicating the pattern of cracking that leads one to suspect the presence of deleterious material. This includes web-like cracking, pattern-like cracking, that is horizontal and vertical cracking, disintegration of blocks, leaving a void in the external leaf of block work, outward bowing of external leaf, wide cracks near the corners, about two inch, about 200 millimeters from the corners, displacement at window and door heads, render blown or missing, and then horizontal cracks. And these can possibly be attributable to day joints in block work. On the left-hand side of this slide, I've shown the rain index map of Ireland, where up in John Paul Farron's country there in North Donegal, uh, there's a rain index factor of 10, and you can see that coming down along the west side of the country, but also on the eastern side of the country where you've got severe exposure as well. Getting back to the house there that I, I referred to in Clare, you can see the pattern cracking. I'll just bring my arrow over it, vertical and horizontal cracking. You can see vertical cracking near the corners. You can see web-like cracking. And you can see at the bottom of the photograph there where I've stuck a, a screwdriver into the, into the wall. And there's that screwdriver on the left-hand side of the next photograph. And that shows a crack which on the 1st of Jan uh, July 2019, the width of the crack was 7.5 millimeters. Uh, in the center photograph is a piece of block work removed from the block work in the house. And on the right-hand side is where I've opened up some holes in the plaster work to take a look at the, the, the block work behind. Uh, this house is in Tipperary, where you've got a severe web-like cracking. This is a house um, where you can see, this is in Limerick, where you can see a vertical crack near the corner of the house, and that measures uh, six millimeters wide. Uh, here's a house with uh, the pass removed and the poor quality of the block working behind it. Uh, this is cracking at, at the junction between a window frame and the plaster reveal, where you've got a gap there of about uh, nine millimeters, and then you've got the, the uh, reveal above it cracked as well. Uh, here's another vertical crack near a corner, and you can see lipping there where I've pushed the, the ruler in behind it, where the right-hand side of the wall is closer to the camera than the left. And this is another house in Limerick, which is, uh, it needs no description, it's a mess. So the aims of this presentation are to share knowledge that will help others be part of the solution. 
And there's a big shortage of, of people to help on this problem at the moment, technical people. There's only about 30 of us registered on the IS465 Engineers Ireland panel at present. And we could do with an awful lot more people to help. And my hope is that we'll see a lot more architects and uh, surveyors being involved uh, in some shape or fashion, uh, at least to do condition assessment reports on houses. Uh, I have a little sub aim, if you like. Uh, I've a long, I'm a long time supporter of CPD. Uh, I'm of an age where I feel I can uh, share some knowledge and I'd like to encourage others that are coming close to retirement, and I'm not saying that I'm going anywhere fast, uh, but you're, you never know what happens in the future. Uh, so anybody coming close to retirement, find a way to share what they have learned in their specialist areas so that valuable knowledge is not lost. And I'm hoping that this presentation might just uh, help people to think uh, along those lines. Uh, I'm hoping that at the end of this presentation, you'll have an understanding of the history of deleterious materials in concrete, know how to prepare a condition assessment report on properties suspected of being impacted by deleterious material in concrete blocks, be able to consider other possible causes of damage, and every expert needs to uh, consider other possible causes um, when he's investigating something. If you don't do that, uh, you stand the risk of being found out. You have to consider everything. Uh, know how to decide where and how to take sample cores from a building for testing. Be familiar with IS465 and the process therein to be followed. And I'm fully aware that IS465 is the subject of, re of review at the moment. And then I want you to have at your disposal an authentic library of references, which I've included at the end of the talk. Now, the dangers of deleterious material in concrete block work is not a new phenom phenomenon. Uh, SI 288 of 1949, the standard specification, solid concrete building blocks made with natural aggregate order 1949, carried the following sentence. The aggregate shall not contain harmful material in sufficient quantity to affect adversely the strength or durability of the concrete. Uh, I was in college in between 1973 and 1977. Uh, in my college days, there was an expectation and I always learned that concrete would achieve about two thirds of its strength in the first 28 days. On the diagram there, I've shown one, uh, I've shown on, on the left-hand side is a diagram taken from one of the, the books that I've included here, where you can see the first 28 days and you're, you've got a graph here showing about two thirds of the strength and then the continuation of uh, increase in strength in years to follow. Undesirable and harmful constituents in aggregate were already known about at that time. These were, not, these were included, but not limited to uh, Fe oxide, sulfide, sulfates. We did not expect concrete to crumble. It is not normal for concrete blocks to disintegrate in the manner they have been seen to do in the last decade or more. And I've included the cover of two books there, uh, A Geology for Engineers by... Uh, um, My, my sheen square is, uh, is getting in the way there. And then the qualities of concrete. Those books are what I used in 1973 as part of my textbooks. When investigating damage um, to a building, it's very important to understand the difference between the type of cracking that you'll get with the subsidence related issue. And I've taken a sketch there on the left-hand side of this slide, which shows the pattern of cracking you can expect to get where subsidence is an issue. That is, uh, where you've got a foundation failure, for instance, going down on the left-hand side, you'll get a diagonal sort of emphasis in the cracking. That diagram was taken from um, subsidence of low-rise buildings, the second edition uh, published by the Institution of Structural Engineers. And this then compared to the very different pattern of cracking you get on the right-hand side, uh, taken from IS465. So I think that's a helpful diagram for those carrying out even pre-purchase property inspections. Um, there's, an, there's a tremendous amount of information uh, available. Uh, the report of the pyrite panel relating to heave and concrete floors was published in 2012. The um, report of the expert panel on concrete blocks was produced in 2017. Um, they're very, very useful references to read. Then after that, you had the um, or sorry, before that, 
you had the building regulations and technical guidance document A uh, dealing with structure, technical guidance document C relating to site preparation and resistance to moisture, and technical guidance document D relating to materials and workmanships are, are um, relevant here. As well as that, then you had um, uh, European um, directives uh, from the late 1980s, uh, early 90s. Um, I've seen a lot of different types of, of walls and insulation around the country. Uh, on the left hand side, uh, you've got um, partially filled cavity with a standard polystyrene insulation. Uh, in the middle bottom photograph, you've got foil backed insulation partially filling the cavity. On the right hand side, you've got um, uh, the fiber type insulation in the cavity. And at the top of the page there, you can see where there's the debris of uh, block work taken from a full field cavity. Um, and then a lot has been written about the different types of, of dashing or plaster and walls. Um, this is what I've, I've, I've looked at around the country in terms of lap plaster. With no insulation and wall cavity, internal pre insulated plaster slab fixed to the inside face of inner leaf of block work. Nap plaster or dry dash with the cavity partially filled uh, with polystyrene board, 40 millimeters or 60 millimeters thick, ordinary or file backed. And then nap plaster, wet dash or dry dash wall cavity with pumped full fill bead insulation or polystyrene board and pumped bead insulation. Wet dash or dry dash finish with yellow fiber insulation full fill in the cavity. So what I'm saying is I've seen damaged, uh, significantly damaged. I'm talking about group four as per IS465 uh, houses with all those different types of plaster and insulation in them. Plaster thickness would vary, vary from about 14 or 16 mil up to about 23, 24 millimeters. Um, arising from that, I, I believe that you should take every opportunity to use every inspection as uh, something that you can input into research and development. So what I've started to do here on houses is when we take the cores out, I have a very patient uh, borer in John Paul Farron, and he works very closely with me. And um, we take moisture readings uh, on the outer face, near the outer face of the outer leaf, in the middle of the outer leaf, on the inside of the, the outer leaf, and near the outside of the inner leaf. And just make a note of those to see if there's any pattern building up. And um, I think that's a very useful tool to use going forward. Uh, in terms of resistance to rain penetration, I think it's very worthwhile to read ES5262991. There's a paragraph included there at the bottom of that, but it's also very important to read the full text of Clause 19 of. Uh, 5262. Five, um, just looking at the three photographs I'd included there, the cracking is much easier to see in plastered, in smooth plastered finishes. Um, you can see the pattern cracking there on the uh, smooth plaster on the left hand photograph. In the middle, you've got a dry dash finish, or sorry, a wet dash finish, um, not quite as obvious. And on the right hand side, you've got the uh, the, the dry dash is on the right hand side uh, and you've got um it's it's much more difficult to see cracking on that so be aware when you're looking particularly at dry dash finishes look carefully for the cracks so then you've got is465 which came out in 2018 and then uh was amended uh on in, in 2020 relating to the assessment testing and categorization of damaged buildings incorporating concrete blocks containing certain deleterious materials and amendment 2020. Then I've included here diagrams taken directly out of IS465. You've got the table on the left hand side giving you the grouping and how to group the, the damage. Group one is undamaged and then you've got increasing level of damages down to significantly damaged which is a group four. And a group four building is, is where you've got pattern cracking on at least one elevation and at least two of the following further items of damage present on the same or adjacent elevation. Uh, and you can read those for yourself. Then 
a very, very important part of all of this is circumstantial evidence, um, risk factors suggesting the possible presence of deleterious material in concrete blocks, um, i.e. information that blocks came from manufacturers reported to have supplied the blocks to other damaged buildings likely to have arisen from deleterious material in concrete blocks. Constructing, construction within the date range of construction. Um, now, this relates to Donegal and Mayo, where it mentioned in the report of the expert panel on concrete blocks, but also when you work your way down through the country, um, you know, to, to build up the trend, to establish the trend of dates there. And then documented information um, of other properties in the same estate or locale having exhibited signs of damage likely to have arisen from deleterious material. On the right hand side is the suite of tests, uh, test suite A, suite B and suite B, suite C. So you can look at those in your own time. Um, then the assessment of samples is subdivided into the test suites. The test suites classify the samples in terms of risk factors and susceptibility to deterioration, to de degradation. The aim of all test suites is to provide uh, sufficient information to determine if the presence of certainly, certain potentially deleterious materials in the concrete block aggregate has or is likely to have resulted in the deterioration of the concrete blocks and the damage to the dwelling identified in the building condition assessment. So I think a very important part of that is, has or is likely to have, I read that as the, having a burden of proof of probability of, of, uh, on the basis of probability. But if you really want to put um, the evidence beyond any reasonable doubt, my experience is that you're likely to find that evidence in the outer leaf of block um, faster than you find it on the inner leaf. For the simple reason, you've got oxygen moisture and you've got uh, pyrite, for instance, and then you've got the chemical reaction where you've got the moisture and the oxygen uh, leading to uh, gypsum. Um, so it's easier to find the, the, the best evidence in the outer leaf of block. Uh, I've just included a slide there in the scope of the IS465 about establishing a protocol uh, to establish the extent of the problem and categorize the dwellings, describe the scope of any testing required and evaluation of the findings, and then to provide the chartered engineer with guidance on the selection of appropriate remedial works to be undertaken. So there's another diagram just giving you the flow chart uh, from IS465, and you can look at that in your own time. Moving on from there, this, this is, is, is a, a chart or a, a series of diagrams uh, prototype for the building condition assessment report. You've got the name of the person carrying out the, ass the assessment, the address, qualifications, date of inspection, the weather conditions, uh, the property address, and description of the site. Um, and, and, you know, is it an open exposed site? Is it in a severely exposed area, moderate or a sheltered site? Um, as per the diagram I showed you, the map of Ireland a little while ago. And then include a site map and a site layout plan. Uh, exposure conditions, we've talked about that. The orientation. The orientation is important because uh, oftentimes you'll find that the most damaged uh, elevation of the building is that exposed to the, the, the most wind and rain. And then a description of the property, the number of floors, the floor areas, the year of construction, uh, has there been an extension built to it? And then a description of the floors, uh, ground floors, first floors, the attic, and then you get on to uh, cavity insulation and whether uh, there's been any extension built and that sort of thing. So then to give a, a brief history of the damage uh, and relevant information, um, then consider circumstantial evidence as we've talked about before. Um, and then to talk about each of the ele elevations with sketches and with photographs and provide a key to the sketches, particularly on internal floors where you want to describe where um, cracks are maybe evident just to show where you have taken those from. So have you got web-like cracking, pattern cracking, disintegrated blocks, overgrowing of uh, external leaf, wide vertical cracks near the corners, displacement of windows and door reveals, render blown or missing or horizontal cracks, all the sort of things that we've talked about before, include photographs and make your report easy to read. Uh, moving on from there, deal with the same 
the front elevation, the left hand elevation, repeat that for all elevations of the building. And then group the building, is it a group one, two, three or four? Uh, and group that in the, in the way that I described a while ago. And then there'll be a damage threshold um, that's proposed under the regulations and uh, the draft regulations. And um, it will be a matter for the, the pr preparer, if you like, or the person that does the condition assessment report to declare uh, that the building meets the da damaged threshold. I want to include here some useful tips for those carrying out surveys because uh, I, just to help people to protect themselves and protect their clients, uh, if you're doing a pre-purchase property inspection, uh, have a system. Be aware of the difference between cracks caused by subsidence and those caused by deleterious material in block work. And one thing I would say is look very closely. What may not look like a serious crack today could be symptomatic of a problem with deleterious material in block work. Uh, familiarize yourself with IS465, have a system, consider the site features, orientation of the dwelling, external and internal condition, including attic drainage systems and water supply. Try to establish the nature of the insulation and walls. Bring and use a moisture meter, be safety aware, check the transfer map and consider planning issues. Uh, make absolutely sure that any equipment you use is calibrated. I'm talking about digital levels or uh, moisture meters and such like. Uh, consider future proposals, part L energy compliance when upgrades are proposed, recommend specialists where needed, heating, plumbing, electrical, asbestos, radon, invasive plant species, etc. Consider circumstantial evidence uh, by location, age, other nearby properties, uh, likely source of blocks, recommend investigative works prior to purchase. I have highlighted prior to purchase. There is no point in telling somebody buying a house that something needs to be monitored if you suspect a problem. Uh, if you leave it down to monitoring, uh, the horse is galled to the person who's bought the house. So it's important if you, if you suspect problems that they should be investigated prior to purchase, not monitored afterwards. Emphasize the limitations of your inspection, protect yourself and protect the house buyer. Things I'd like to see happen. I believe every citizen of the state uh, receives equal treatment, regardless of geographic location. If they can prove that their property has or is likely to have been damaged by deleterious material, I would like to see them looked after. The elimination of the opt-out option from the building regulation point of view, and I've, I've put the uh, form there on the right-hand side of that. I disagree with the option, and I all, have always disagreed with the opt-out option. I think uh, the new building uh, regulations were brought in with the signed cert certifiers and all that for a reason. It was to improve standards. And then shortly afterwards, about a year after that was brought in, this famous opt-out option was, was, was um, granted. So I'd like to see that gone. It has already been recommended in the report of the expert panel on concrete blocks. Engineers Ireland have also made their thoughts known on that as well. Uh, so I'd like to see more research into the whole area of deleterious material in buildings because I'd like to see future generations protected from unintended consequences. So look, I've included uh, a whole range of, of um, publications there that you can read in your own time. And um, I'd like to say again, a very special word of thanks to Engineers Ireland, the Thomond region, the West region, the Northwest region, and the structures and construction um, division for giving me this opportunity. And a very, very special thanks to John Paul Farron, who's to follow, and to Dr. Chris Brough, who will speak after him. Thanks very much indeed. Hi there. Um, my name is John Paul Farron from Anytime Corn. And firstly, I'd like to thank John Garrett and Mike Griffin from the Thomond region for giving me this opportunity to, to speak today. So our company to date has, we work with 13 of the IS465 registered engineers, and we have sampled some in the region of 1800 properties to date throughout 10 different companies in Ireland. 
or sorry, 10 different counties within Ireland. So the purpose of the sampling procedure is to retain representative samples of the concrete material. So here we have an example of prior to sampling, engineer would forward us on a photo or a sketch of the property marked up with where they potentially want the samples extracted from. When we're on site, we check for services, for example, gas, electrical, oil line, waste, or sewage. Um, we take care because we, we definitely don't want to have any services on site. Okay. So an absolute minimum of eight samples shall be taken from each property. Two internal and six external samples are to be extracted. Two of the six external samples are from the rising um, block work below ground level. One internal and one rising wall sample are sent for compressive strength testing. So when we're extracting the internal samples, we extract those from outside. So we, we adopted that strategy when COVID-19 came about. It minimized the time that we spent within the, within inside the house itself. And it also keeps everyone happy because it's there's no dust and there's no mess within the house either. So um, you could say 98% of the time you can extract the internal sample without going in and it doesn't break the, the skin within. So everyone's happy. Um, the samples can't be taken from the chimney breast as this will alter the chemical test results. Okay. So here we have an example of the chain of custody form. The sample should be recorded and detailed on the chain of custody form and then submitted to the petrographer. So what we, we just fill in the owner's name, the address, the chartered engineer's name, the date that the samples are extracted on. We give each job a project number and we use the IS465 protocol, the sampling technician also. We would have, so each each sample would have its own unique, um, its own unique reference number, and that would be filled down on the bag. It would also be replicated onto this form. We would put on the geographical location of where the sample was extracted. We would also tick the box if it's been extracted from above DPC, below DPC, four fifty below DPC, an inner or an outer. Um, we would also put the the drilling characteristics, for example, if it's wet, the sample's wet or damp. Um, we also take if we've taken photos um, as well. Um, below, which is samples taken by, so that would be from the, the, the Corin contractor. The company name would be written there also, and the date would be signed. We also have samples approved by, so the engineer's um, signature would go on there his company name and the date of the samples. Then samples received by would be, that would be for the geologist. So when the samples are sent and the geologist opens the samples, they're attached with the chain of custody form. So the geologist will check the samples and um, make sure that everything ties up, the numbers in the bags and the labels within. And that's the chain of custody form. So each sample is recorded, noting the location, diameter, length, and condition of the samples, and include the signature on the chain of custody form um, to indicate that they were extracted in accordance with the standard. It's very important to have a dry coin sampling procedure, um, and that it's taken entirely within one block and free from water joints. Um, that would be very, very important. So. When samples go for compressive strength testing, it's very important that there's no mortar joints within that because it will alter the result of the um, compressive strength testing. Okay. It is necessary to ensure that the samples are collated accurately and packaged individually in sealed plastic bags, labeling the number, each sample, and the date and address and location. It is also helpful to have a photographic account of the sampling procedure. Um, 
So what we would do there is when we take the sample, we would put it into the, the bag and on the bag would be marked the sample number. We would we would hold that it prevents the um, sampling location or where the sample came from. And we would make sure and have photographic evidence, one up close and one from the full elevation of the house. So it's very handy to you for the geologist. Okay. So here we have an example of where we have extracted an, an external sample. We've gone right through and we have taken the insulation as well. Now we take great care in extracting the insulation from the core sleeve because that insulation is usually a perfect fit to go back in. So we've gone right through and we've taken the internal sample there as well. And that's one of the occasions where we haven't broken the skin on the inside. So everyone's happy there. Um, it's very important also when we are um, repairing or reinstating this, that we reinstate it as we found it and we don't create a bridge across the cavity. Particular care and attention should be taken to this um, because, well, for obvious reasons. So um, this is an example of the substructure rising wall samples that we extract. And so what we're doing, what we aim to do is down you see the, where it says number 10, that's, you can see the tolerance there, that's a 100 millimeter block. And it says within the standard that it can't be any less than a 100 millimeter sample you send. So you've got, if you don't even have a millimeter of tolerance there to play with. So it's, we take extreme care and caution when extracting the, the underground samples in particular. Um, it's very hard to, it's very easy to, to um, stray outside of conformity, but um, no, we take, we take serious, serious care as advice to be taken at that part. So reinstating of these holes, you would be expected to, um, to reinstate with concrete, tarmac, pavers, or grass, and try, you would leave the property as you found it. Um, so um, that's it. That's it from the sampling process. I appreciate, um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this and um, thank you all for listening. Um, you can feel free to, answer, to ask any questions. We'll try our best to answer them. Okay, so I will hand you over to, to Chris Brock now from Petrolab and I'm looking forward to this myself. Thank you everyone. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for being here this evening. Uh, thank you, John Paul. Uh, I'd also like to thank Engineers Island and John Garrett for the invite to speak uh, this evening. I'll be talking about uh, the, the significance of uh, braidable free mica and reactive sulfides, uh, particularly pyrotite and pyrite within defective concrete blocks uh, from Ireland. I'd just like to acknowledge from the outset, uh, thanks as well to my colleagues um, who've contributed to this presentation or have already given presentations uh, outlining some of our thoughts on this. Uh, Bradley Staniforth and Rachel Garside and Corinne Garner, uh, also grateful to John Fletcher and James Strongman. Uh, and a particular point of thanks to Rory Colville, who's done an awful lot of data extraction from the reports uh, over the last two to three years. By way of brief introduction, we've analysed a little over 2,000 properties now uh, and have seen a, a wide range of uh, concrete blocks within that timescale. Uh, with respect to actually the examples on the opening page here, the far left is a defective uh, phyllite block. Uh, next along is black limestone, typical to County Mayo, also uh, commonly uh, defective. The two further ones are two occasionally, uh, or often less than occasionally, more than occasionally rather, defective concrete blocks from County Donegal, a quartzite mixed with fine mafix and a weathered micaceous quartzite, and I'll be talking uh, about these as well. Uh, with respect to where we're at, uh, this is a heat map of where we've tested properties from within uh, Republic of Ireland. It's been heavily focused around County Donegal and County Mayo. We've also got some hotspots now in County Clare and County Limerick. It originates from the boom years of the late uh, 1990s and 2000s, 
where uh, defective block work um, or insufficient aggregate testing appears to take place and defective aggregate has been used uh, in, in block work uh, containing excessive abradable free mica, pyrotite and pyrite. Degradation in some cases has proceeded rapidly, uh, presenting thousands of homes within uh, years or decades of construction. And in some instances, as uh, has been shown in the pictures in previous presentations, degradation has been severe. Uh, I'd like to touch, oh, and, and, and of course, standards have come into play now, specifically dealing with the use of deleterious aggregates. IS398 covers the use of hard fill. IS465 obviously relates to block work. Uh, I want to touch briefly on this uh, sort of politics, but also the parallel to the Mundic process uh, in Cornwall. Uh, the parallel uh, is a useful one to consider, particularly maybe looking at longer time scales. Uh, it's also important to note with damage to properties caused by faulty construction, there are uh, always significant socio-political impacts uh, because homes and lives and livelihoods are, are turned upside down. Uh, with respect to the Mundic process in Cornwall, um, cases first appeared before our parliament in 1982 that were carried by this MP, David Penhalligan, and then later by uh, Lord uh, Matthew Taylor, who was his successor. With respect to Mundic, most of that concrete block work was used in houses in the 1920s and 1930s. And similarly to what happened and what is happening, in fact, within Ireland, the worst cases typically occurred within the first 10, 20 years, uh, requiring um, uh, immediate remediation or demolition. Uh, but it took up to 40 to 50 years for another sort of cohort to start coming through in, in, as a consistent problem. Hence, it came before our parliament in the 1980s. And then the first uh, issue of uh, the Monday guidance appeared in 1994. The reason I raised that is uh, it was the second edition, really the 1997 edition, which provided uh, a very important blueprint for how Monday was handled and is still handled to the present day uh, within the Cornwall situation. And it might be that when IS465 is revised, it's the second edition that becomes a, a sort of critical marker in the sand. Moving on to what's uh, happening in Ireland, the MICA scandal, as it was termed, uh, began in 2011 and the pirate scandal in 2007. It's politically still a very live issue. We're, with, we're within that 10 to 20 years from build to severe degradation. But as a parallel to the Monday process, it is, uh, well, it is likely that there'll be a longer term lag to some of the properties uh, experiencing degradation. Um, uh, uh, yeah. It's worth reflecting. We just It is unknown at this stage the extent to which poor aggregate has been embedded now within the housing stock of uh, the Republic of Ireland. Where this originates from, ultimately this is a geological, uh, uh, originates as a geological um, uh, phenomenon. Uh, this is a geological map of the Republic of, well, the whole island of Ireland. Uh, if you look to the north, uh, uh, County Donegal has a unique geology dominated by metasediments in the Grampian orogeny. Uh, that's uh, metasediments, metapelites, uh, through the typical Barovian sequence to schists, phyllites, then schists, then green schists, and amphibolites. With respect to the county south of Donegal, there's this light blue uh, carboniferous limestone that covers much of the remaining counties. The limestone itself that makes up most of that is fairly okay. But interbedded within that is some deep sea oozes from the original um, depositional environment, which contain calcareous mudstones, argillaceous limestones, and calcareous siltstones, often containing abundant framboidal pyrite, which is the uh, sulfide of concern uh, associated with organic carbon and stylolites, uh, generally present within aggregate that is weak, friable, and subject to expansion. Uh, and it's this uh, which has posed the uh, problem when used in block work and uh, in hard film. Uh, I'm going to focus the next part of the talk on County Donegal. Uh, there's a slight uh, degree of complexity with respect to County Donegal, and so that might take up uh, a significant amount of the remainder of the talk, but I will move on to uh, the, the remaining counties as well because they are also important. Okay, Donegal is unique with respect to the Republic of Ireland. It has, uh, uh, unique with respect to its geology. There are multiple aggregate types in use that we've seen. We can uh, detect at least 25 uh, that are in use on a regular basis. 
Of this, there's one main high risk concrete. Uh, this was the subject of the paper by Lehman et al. Uh, it's the phyllite dominant aggregate. Uh, there is a subtype to this, a phyllite quartzite, that we can also sort of detect and separately characterize, but it's uh, considered to belong to the, the same essential aggregate and is thought to represent simple geological variability within the aggregate at source or at quarry source. On top of this, there are six other high risk concretes to be noted, uh, and I will talk more about these specifically as, as we go through. Uh, but I'll talk now about pyrotites. So with respect to the phyllite block, um, the pyrotite, uh, which is present within that, it's concentrations that exceed compliance values uh, set out uh, by EN12620. It's responsible for sulfide oxidation and internal sulfate attack. Where we've seen it in degraded uh, concrete, we see it forming uh, radial cracks within the aggregate, uh, contributing to cracks within the binder and internal cracks within aggregates as well. How the reaction is progressing, the pyrotite is oxidizing to iron oxides. This is forming expansive uh, cracking. Uh, you get subsequent formation of etrigite and thormazite. The thormazite in particular is a problem when it, because uh, it consumes binding agents within the cement, causing the concrete effectively to crumble. And some work that we've been doing on accelerated weathered, weathering tests seems to confirm that exact mechanism as well, uh, that uh, is causing where present, where the pyrotite is reacting, it's, it's causing a sort of crumbling mechanism. There looks to be a slight difference between outer leaf and inner leaf with respect to the degree of carbonation and therefore the reaction that's occurring. And it's possible, um, we only have anecdotal information at this stage, but it's possible that inner leaf, the sulfate formation is favored by gypsum, uh, but this is still an expansive sulfate reaction and will still cause cracking within the concrete. Uh, got a reflected light image here showing an example of oxidation of the pyrotite. Uh, on the left of the field of view, you've got, uh, which is pyrotite uh, in sort of beige yellow color present within the aggregate and currently unreacted. And the pyrotite within the binder, uh, also beige yellow, but showing substantial uh, reaction to iron oxides in light gray. You also get some sulfate formation uh, forming within the uh, um, adjacent binder. With respect to pyrotite, it's important to note that there are other aggregates in use in County Donegal that contain pyrotite. Uh, and this is uh, to be expected given the nature of the ground and effect and, and uh, the continuum, sort of the continuum, if you like, between low grade metasediments and higher and higher grade sort of schist and amphibolites. So just to familiarize yourself with this chart. Uh, this is a chart, a box and whisker chart showing the range of total sulfur values in different aggregates in use uh, within County Donegal. Uh, the two in the middle, PHQ and PHY, are the two subtypes of the phyllites. The PHY is far more common uh, and it's been associated with, um, it's a far more common of the two phyllite groups. Uh, so those two can be considered as a single sort of aggregate unit. Uh, along the y-axis, you've got metamorphic grade. Uh, so further along the y, uh, further on the x-axis, sorry, is increasing metamorphic grade. And the y-axis, the total sulfur is uh, a calculated, taking into account the sulfur that would normally be present in the cement and accounting for also the density difference between cement and aggregate. So in terms of metamorphic grade, then uh, you've got uh, some very weakly metamorphosed uh, to unmetamorphosed sort of, uh, mudstone, siltstone, slates, uh, Hornfells in that MSD code, uh, which we've which we've grouped them as. You then got your phyllite bracket. The next grade up is schist, and the next grade above that is green schist to amphibolites. And you can see that. Oh, sorry, wrong way. Uh, you can see that all four of these aggregate types exceed the compliance value set out in EN one two six twenty, which states that for aggregates known to contain pyrotite, anything that exceeds zero point one percent total sulfur is non-compliant. We have had requests from surveyors to try and put risk characterizations on pyrotite content. There is a challenge to this uh, because all these aggregates are technically non-compliant. Therefore, we currently record them all as significant risk if the total sulfur exceeds compliance values. There's obviously overlap between all of these aggregates as well in terms of their total sulfur values. There are BCA threes and fours. 
and building condition assessments. This was uh, what John Garrett was, was talking about earlier. Associated with uh, the low grade MSD group, associated obviously with the phyllite group and associated with the schist group as well. We've not seen any evidence yet for BCAs threes and fours associated with green schist and amphibolite, but we have actually very few examples from that group as well. So we don't know whether that's a function of sampling um, because sampling has, has quite reasonably been focused on the degraded properties and the degraded properties are dominated by phyllite or whether it's actually just not in use very much. It's not clear at this stage. It is possible as well that the green schist amphibolite being a stronger aggregate and the binder being better quality is better able to resist any internal sulfate attack. There is precedent to that. With respect to Cornwall, we had an aggregate in use in the 1920s, 30s called the Penley Dolerite, had very high total sulfur by today's standards in excess of 1%, 1-2%, and is no longer in use for that reason. Uh, but because it was already existed in block work, the decision had to be made as to whether it counted as deleterious or not with respect to the Mundic guidance. And evidence of the last 100 years, and it was formalised in the 1997 second edition and subsequent third edition of the Mundic guidance in 2016, is that the penalty dollar right is considered retrospectively to have been safe for use because the aggregate was hard and durable and capable of encapsulating the reactive sulphide. This may apply to the green schist amphibolite, um, but more research will be required to confirm that. With respect to the other four, uh, less, uh, less certainty certainly applies to that. More research is required, but we do have BCA threes and fours associated with all of those other two aggregate types. Worth noting that the pyrotite content within the lowest grade group, the MSDs, is uh, very variable and it's often a subordinate sulfide in comparison to the pyrite. And this obviously causes some confusion as to which uh, compliance code applies. Uh, at the moment, EN12620 is read, states simply that for aggregates known to contain pyrotite, doesn't state whether the pyrotite is a dominant sulfide or not, simply that aggregates that contain pyrotite, uh, the compliance value of 0.1% applies. That being the case, uh, these are currently non-compliant. Uh, but, there, but, but there, again, there's a slight question mark on that because they tend to be pyrite dominant rather than pyrotype. Free mica then, does it still matter? Uh, this is obviously a question that's been posed uh, in uh, recent correspondence. It's a question we've received from homeowners indirectly uh, and uh, to some extent from uh, uh, the people we've been working with. We think it does still matter it primarily as a measure for poor quality binder, and I'm going to lay out one of some of the issues that it causes within this slide. It is common to abundant, abundant in phyllite block. It may be common in low-grade metasediments and schists, and it's common in a rare subset of gravels as well. Issues that it causes uh, in, it leads to high microporosity binder. That's increased capillary porosity between the binding agents within the cement. Uh, increases its ability to retain moisture. Obviously important when moisture is an accelerant for any, let's say, oxidation, sulfide oxidation reactions that are occurring. These are high water cement ratios. You can adjust for free mica when you're making concrete block by adding in increased cement, but the evidence we received, or evidence from testing, is that in most concrete blocks we're looking at, not all, but most, no adjustment has been made. So you've ended up with this high microporosity binder, high capillary porosity, high water cement ratios, lower cement than would be required, Higher voidage, the higher voidage has implications because it's easier then for cracks to link across voids. And in general, because of the capillary porosity, the binder is more susceptible to weakening. Uh, so in turn, and susceptible to secondary attack. So in terms of secondary attack that is occurring, internal sulfate attack, most obviously within the phyllite block. Uh, we've also seen some evidence for that uh, in some of the other aggregates. External sulfate attack, I'm only mentioning this briefly, but it's something to be referenced as a compounding factor. We've seen it in several properties where the aggregate is not the source of the sulfate uh, and there appears to be some groundwater or ground conditions or associated building envelope conditions. It's not clear uh, where the thormazite is coming from, but it's not related to the aggregate. Uh, wet dry cycling. Uh, it appears to be that the below grounds are particularly susceptible where there is increased capillary porosity, particularly as well when iron oxides are an inherent part of the aggregate. Wet dry cycling seems to encourage disaggregation of uh, aggregate from binder. And so it leads to some weakening. 
freestyle cycling, obviously that, there has to be freestyle occurring for freestyle cycling to be producing damage. So it's very environmentally dependent. Um, but where freestyle is happening, all the aggregate that we've tested with elevated free mica is very susceptible to, to break down due to the increased capillary porosity. Okay, so the other 10% within County Donegal, it's important to talk about these because this is one in 10 of the, the properties affected. Some of them come to this Donegal black limestone, so 40 to 70% problematic lithologies, similar failure mechanism to County Mayo, so we'll talk about that a bit more with respect to when we get to the limestones in County Mayo and, and some of the other counties. Schist uh, with intercalated marbles. Uh, this is a different aggregate type from the phyllite. We have reasonable confidence that it comes from a separate quarry altogether as variable free mica and pyrotite content. Uh, so it doesn't always get noted as high risk, but in terms of how we calculated this 10% bracket, only those that are, are counted as, as high risk are included in this 10% bracket. And so it is, it is still 10%. Uh, the, 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 the damage, properties that have contained uh, uh, BCA4s have had high free mica and uh, high pyrotite content. Uh, low grade meta sediments, uh, there's several subtypes. Uh, there's not always high risk, uh, generally moderate to high free mica and variable sulfide content. Sulfide content is generally pyrite dominant, pyrotite is generally subordinate. Uh, and so there's queries as to how the EN12620 code applies. Uh, but again, the, these are associated with BCA3s and 4s as well. Corsite plus mafix, this is unique to County Donegal. There's a fine, this is a mixture of two aggregates. The fine mafix used in there can be a whole range of different mafixes that have been added in. So this must reflect some variation in aggregate source. Sometimes they contain high sulfides, and so this is a direct example of internal sulfate attack when it occurs. Whether the micaceous quartzites and grey wackies. Uh, this is a really uh, important aggregate to consider. We've seen it in upwards of 100 properties now. There's no sulfides or very, very low sulfides present inherent to the aggregate. Common to abundant free mica, it's associated with BCAs, threes and fours, high iron oxides. Uh, in fact, what we have also seen in here very rarely is some evidence for primary sulfates, which we think are associated with the initial aggregate. It's a very variably performing aggregate. It's also been prepared in different ways. Uh, so sometimes it's mixed with a fine aggregate as well, a fine beach sand or a fine quartz sand, and that seems to stabilize it a bit. Uh, but the, the failure mechanism appears to apply or relate to uh, when it does fail, when it is severely degraded, to the abundant free mica, the iron oxides as well, and what looks to be wet dry cycling effectively. So moisture is coming in and out, in and out, in and out, and it's, it's it maybe picking on. Uh, the ability of the concrete block to retain moisture and maybe some loose bonding between the iron oxides uh, and uh, therefore the aggregate and the binder. And there's a rare subset of gravels that are implicated in the same way. Uh, but really, you could, you could almost group those rare gravels in with the weather micaceous quartzite as, as having a similar potential failure mechanism. Okay, so overall risk with respect to County Donegal, I'm just going to show up this. Uh, this diagram, so that's a metamorphic gray diagram, typical Barovian sequence running from metapelite to slate to phyllite to schist at the top. Below this, I've put in a risk diagram showing our, if you like, indicative assessment of risk by aggregate type for the meta sediments of, of County Donegal. Uh, so phyllite block is always high risk. It's the highest risk we see in terms of the rapidity of the degradation uh, and the severity of it. Uh, the schist and intercalated marbles, though, can also be severely degraded, uh, variable free mica and pyrotite content, and the damaged properties that we've seen have had high free mica and pyrotite. It's possible that this might be an aggregate that becomes more important down the line uh, because the schist might be variably encapsulating the pyrotite for the present moment, but given the foliated nature of schist, it's not a complete or, or potentially suitable encapsulation. Uh, but it is variable and sometimes the free mica and the sulfide levels are lower and so you can lower the risk rating on that basis. Low grade meta sediments, several subtypes, not always high risk, generally moderate free mica and variable sulfide content, again generally pyrite dominant. 
uh, can be lower risk when there's free mica and sulfide content is low. Quartzite plus mafix, as mentioned, just depends on the sulfide content of that fine mixed aggregate, that's the fine aggregate that's mixed in. Where did micaceous quartzite sit in with the, the low grade metasediments in terms of its risk characterization? Abundant free mica, high iron oxides, very low sulfides, and similarly the rare subset gravels. In terms of where we place high risk on the basis of BCA threes and fours and of the degradation also we see sometimes down the petrographic microscope as well, the high risk is generally running around there. So the, the low grade metal sediments, the weather micaceous quartzites, the phyllites, and most of the schists sit as high risk aggregate that needs further work uh, or, um, or remediation in some way. If we move on then to uh, Mayo, there's uh, um, Limerick and Clare and, and many of the other counties. The picture in, is in some respects simpler. Uh, nearly 98% relates to, 98% uh, of high risk aggregate relates to uh, the use of calcareous mudstones and limestones, uh, argillaceous limestones uh, and calcareous siltstones from across these counties. 2% uh, relate to some uh, unusual uh, um, we're not, again, that 2% may be something that expands with time. Uh, it just depends a little bit on, on um, what's actually in the housing stock and how, how the uh, sampling proceeds uh, through the years. There are recognizable subtypes by counties, um, and I'll talk just briefly about those. In terms of the sulfur grades, we've got data from seven counties so far. Results often fall within or only just exceed EN12620 codes, which is 1% for allowable sulfur in aggregate when pyrite is the main sulfide. However, it's hosted within problematic lithologies that are prone to sulfide oxidation. And this has been recognized in subsequent remediation standards, the IS398 and IS465. Familiarizing yourself with that uh, particular graph, total sulfur in aggregate is along the y-axis. The counties are along the x-axis, but they're, uh, they're anonymized for the moment, just given uh, alphanumeric codes. The furthest to the right is the grey limestone GLS. This is the negligible or very low risk limestone that is also commonly in use across these southern counties. So if you compare against that, that when framboidal pyrite is present within framboidal, sorry, when framboidal pyrite is present within problematic lithologies, you can effectively work to a much lower total sulfur, um, allowable total sulfur, something more like 0.4 to 0.5%. One broad underlying cause, which is framboidal pyrites. Uh, this reaction is, is slightly simpler to summarize in some respects. Uh, it's framboidal pyrites, those nano clusters of pyrites, uh, oxidizes to go right here on the outer rim, uh, reacts to form sulfuric acid, which then reacts with the carbonates within the limestone to form gypsum. Gypsum is an expansive sulfate when it forms, leads to cracking in uh, concrete block work and hard fill. Uh, and so there are some slight variations by county. Uh, two aggregates, two slightly separate aggregates recognized uh, within Mayo. The first type uh, exceeds EN 12620 codes sometimes, uh, often shows rapid deterioration. But with respect to Mundic comparison, it's, it's worth noting that houses can remain in good condition for many years before finally deteriorating. Uh, and this is likely to apply uh, both to the, in the situation in Donegal uh, with respect to some of the aggregates in, in use there. Uh, and also with respect to these limestone aggregates as well. Um, they can remain stable for some time before they, they go, but then when they go, they can go quickly. Which is therefore likely as a general comment, there are houses at the moment showing no signs of deterioration, but that will ultimately fail. With respect to East Mayo, uh, there's a second type. It has lower levels of problematic lithologies. Um, uh, it's often partially dolomitized with muddy lenses concentrated along stylolites within the limestone. Uh, I say that East Mayo and Donegal are very similar, and it's not clear that they're, it might be, well, they are just very similar, so uh, they can, they, they end up with very similar risk characterization. They don't always come out high risk, sometimes the problematic pathologies and total sulfur values are low enough that you can, that you can uh, conclude that a low medium risk characterization. I'm just conscious of time, uh, so I will uh, try and proceed quickly to conclusions and research. Uh, with respect to Clare and Limerick, uh, this is more calcareous siltstones rather than limestones, uh, slightly distinct from the Mayo concrete block working that a fine sand has been mixed in 
to the block work. Uh, total sulfur is usually within the EN12620 codes, but it's still high risk and it's prone to sulfate formation. Again, this is why the IS465 standard was written for, for pyrite in particular uh, in these southern counties, because it, the problematic lithologies means that the, the EN12620 code is too generous with respect to allowable sulfur uh, when problematic lithologies are present. Uh, Dublin also calcareous siltstones. Uh, the block work doesn't appear to have been prepared from the Toba Colleen formation. Uh, which was responsible in part for the IS398. Uh, hard fill remediation appears to come from the Lucan formation, uh, but it's still the same, uh, same issue for amboidal pyrite in uh, muddy zones within healthcare of siltstone. Uh, and other counties are showing similar failure mechanisms. There's a, there's, there is this um, uh, other, there's sometimes there's a few other things. There's some counties show fine pyrite rather than just framboidal pyrite. Uh, there's evidence of marcasite in rare cases, and there's even one, uh, one of the, some examples of sulfidiferous mine waste being used, which is, um, uh, uh, yeah, well, very interesting from the Mundic uh, uh, point of view. It's very similar to what we have down here. Uh, compounding factors. Uh, uh, well, just to note, we mentioned this in the, in the pre legislative scrutiny meeting last year. Uh, but the, the ground conditions mean that sometimes we are seeing external sulfate attack on properties that contain no known deleterious component, no free mica, no sulfides. The aggregate is otherwise fine, but the block work is severely degraded. And sometimes we see evidence for external sulfate attack in aggregate um, that, that is would also uh, be problematic. So there is this compounding factor of external sulfate attack that is occurring in the minority of cases. There's concerns about the building envelope. Sometimes the render seems to be insufficiently suitable for the weather conditions, uh, excessive bleed channels as well impacting uh, CST performance. I think just to round off, uh, we recognize that whilst uh, uh, research is ongoing and some excellent research has been done, there is still further research needed. Uh, the, uh, particularly the extent to which inner leaf and below grounds can be retained, the extent to which foundations may be affected, um, what are low, medium, high risk pyrotite levels? Or do we just uh, conclude that anything about 0.1% is high risk, regardless of the compliant used? Can non-compliant aggregate be passed retrospectively now that it's in block work, but if, if it's not prone to reaction? Again, I'm sort of shout, uh, echoing the, the situation with the penny dollar right uh, as used in Mundic. Uh, what are the moisture levels required to instigate internal sulfate attacks? So if you are arguing for retention of inner leaf or uh, on the basis that you can keep moisture out of there, what is the moisture level required to keep below to prevent that internal sulfate attack? Uh, what are the causes and ground conditions for external sulfate attack? Why do we see this in, in a minority of cases? And further research, further research is into the acceptable level of free mica, particularly with respect to that weather micaceous quartzite aggregate that's in commonly in use and appears sometimes, well, and, and sometimes uh, very critically degraded. Um, conclusions then, whilst multiple factors are in play in terms of mineralogy, it's been the degradation has been driven by pyrosite, uh, framboidal pyrite, and uh, free mica in Donegal is a compounding uh, factor because it's producing binder that's weak and susceptible to deterioration from secondary mechanisms. Deterioration has been, de um, uh, it's been de depends on aggregates coming from the unique geology, uh, the Grampian or eroding in County Donegal and the carboniferous limestones in the rest of Ireland. I think the, the if one take home sentence would be, and certainly from the parallel with the Mundix, unfortunately it is very likely that there's going to be many more houses we'll need testing over the next 10 to 20 years. And, uh, and whilst we've had some houses fail, a lot of houses fail critically in the last, in, within 10 to 20 years of construction, um, you're, you, you're going to look, be looking at houses testing 30, 40, 50 years down the line after construction. Uh, okay, uh, that brings my talk to an end. Thank you for listening.